All right, Sue, cool. We're a couple, we're just about a couple minutes after. So why don't you kick us off and we'll get started? Yeah, definitely. All right. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm really glad um, those of you who could join us did so. I know it's a crazy time, so I appreciate you taking the time and um, giving us your evening. Um, I hope everyone is safe and healthy and your families are doing well as, as well. Um, so tonight we're going to have a small webinar about advocating for more solar in Arizona. Um, so our agenda for this evening, we're going to do some quick intros, um, discuss your role in solar rights, solar in Arizona, advocacy at the um, Corporation Commission, FERC, the Salt River Project, what you can do, and some next steps. And then quickly, just some logistics. If you have a question at any point in the meeting, um, go ahead and use the chat feature and type in your question. Um, I know there's also a Q&A button, but um, please use the chat button instead. Um, and then if you have any technical difficulties, go ahead and um, type that into the chat as well. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Suk. Um, I am Sun's um, Arizona policy and advocacy intern this summer. Um, I'm a senior at ASU. I'm studying political science and sustainability. Um, and my concentration is in energy policy. I'm, I'm really passionate about um, our future energy transition and creating a greener, cleaner future. Um, I have quite a bit of um, experience in advocacy. I've um, campaigned on a few congressional campaigns. Most recently, I worked as a page at the Arizona State Senate. Um, and I'm also quite involved in my school. I served as director of sustainability um, on our student government. And I've, I've been involved in some um, energy research projects as well. So I'm really excited for learning new things here at this internship. And I'll pass it along to Brett. Hey, great, great, Suk. We're really excited to have you at Sun for the summer. And, um, you know, she's she's been really doing some great work so far for us and uh, has accomplished a lot more than I uh, probably did in college. So she's got a bright future ahead and hopefully we can springboard her out into the world to make a lot of change. Um, my name is Brett Fanshaw. I'm the Arizona Program Director for Solar United Neighbors. I live in, uh, in Central Phoenix. And my background is um, in energy policy and, and environmental uh, campaigning. So I spent about 10 years working for an environmental nonprofit, advocating for solar, working on uh, public lands issues, um, and you know, figuring out how to make change here in Arizona. So we're, uh, you know, I'm super excited to be talking to you tonight about uh, kind of the ins and outs of solar policy in the state and uh, how we can make an impact on some of the really kind of big and important discussions that are going on um, here in Arizona, but also uh, nationally right now. <clears throat> so I think first off, you know, many folks uh, are probably you know, generally aware of this, but uh, lobbying is an important uh, activity for citizens to take on, you know, oftentimes our elected officials are hearing from uh, folks that are paid to, uh, to lobby them on, on behalf of, of their companies or, uh, or their other interests. And so, you know, when we have a stake in a policy, it's important to, to speak out. And there's, you know, there's uh, definitely some power in numbers that comes along with that. And so, you know, as far as Solar United Neighbors is concerned, we also know that as we help people put solar on their homes and uh, get more intimately familiar with how they're using energy and how certain decisions are impacting their choices, uh, we want to be able to, <clears throat> you know, have folks speak up and speak out on, on those uh, issues that are um, affecting them. And so, you know, uh, folks that are, uh, have a stake in the clean energy economy are, are motivated to, to show up and we hope that uh, you will be too. And many of you have already, so that's great. Uh, just from a baseline here, you know, we believe that we have some, uh, some rights as, as solar owners and, and users, that we've got a fundamental freedom to make our own energy choices, to install solar on our roof, to do so without uh, interference from uh, or hurdles or blockades put up by uh, utility companies. 
and that we're entitled to the fair credit for the energy that we're sending back to the utility grid. And that's, you know, that's been a really big crux of a lot of conversations that have gone on uh, in Arizona and around the country is, you know, are you getting enough uh, credit back on your utility bill every month for all that extra solar that you might be sending to, to your utility? And we, we believe that everyone should be getting a fair amount that's, uh, you know, that's worth what it's worth to the energy grid. So there's a lot of exciting things happening in, in solar in Arizona. We are the third ranked state for the amount of total solar capacity installed, uh, just over 4,600 megawatts of solar. And uh, we're behind California, uh, which most folks probably could guess, but the uh, state we're also behind is North Carolina, which is kind of, uh, uh, kind of interesting. And I think that we need to uh, pass North Carolina again soon. Um, over $12 billion have been invested in solar uh, in Arizona, and there's now uh, over 150,000 homes that uh, have solar installed uh, in the state. We are sixth in the country for the number of jobs uh, in solar. It's uh, close to 8,000, and we rank 10th for the number of companies uh, with uh, 473. And we threw this uh, map on here from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory because I think it sort of is intuitive to a lot of us that live here, but uh, it's a good visual that you know, just shows that this is where solar should be happening. We should be encouraging it as, as much as, as possible. So there, there are many solar policy issues that come up from time to time, and some of them are kind of ongoing and longstanding. I'm going to kind of tick through this list, and I expect that maybe we'll, we'll have some questions uh, later on, maybe about any of these in particular. Um, but then I'm going to spend a little bit more time talking about some of the specific bodies where decisions get made and how we can um, impact those, uh, those decisions and those decision makers. But I think it's important to kind of start with, you know, what are the things that we're talking to <clears throat> officials about? So uh, one, one really important issue that's going on right now is the renewable energy standard and tariff or the rest. And we'll go into this a little bit deeper uh, in a couple of slides, but you know, that's, it's been the policy that's, uh, that's encouraged renewable energy in Arizona. It calls for 15% renewables by 2025 and was set back in 2007. Um, that's controlled by the Arizona Corporation Commission. Um, net metering and now today export credits for solar are a super important policy that is you know, the deciding factor on what you're getting back from your utility for that extra energy you're sending to the grid. So uh, if you have net metering, which was the, the old way um, uh, that you know, some, many states are still using, but Arizona unfortunately moved away from, is uh, the one-to-one -one credit for the power that you're uh, sending back. So you will, uh, for at any time of day, that extra power that you have sent back to, to SRP or APS, they'll credit you back for the same as you would have paid for that, that power. Today, uh, most folks are getting uh, an export rate credit back that is just the um, a set rate by the Corporation Commission uh, that uh, often, you know, can be less than what you would have gotten for net metering or the utilities kind of switch the rates around so that your power is, is less expensive. So you're getting kind of less back and they're making more from you and these other fees. So that brings me to rate design, uh, which is where there are also a lot of issues that we uh, come up against when utilities are designing rates for customers and what they mean for solar customers. So uh, this, this includes things like demand charges that uh, many SRP customers uh, are figuring out how to deal with and uh, making sure that their solar can still return on their investment. Um, but it's also things like grid access charges which APS charges uh, for one of their rate plans just for the privilege of being able to use the grid. So there are different ways that uh, fees and rate structures have been sort of targeted at solar customers in Arizona and, and uh, hopefully at some point we can uh, work to address some of these in, in a better way. Uh, on the positive side, there are 
uh, tax credits and incentives that continue to foster the growth of, of solar in Arizona and around the country. Uh, we have a federal tax credit that's uh, currently worth 26% of the cost of the system. Um, and there's a state incentive for Arizona, which is uh, $1,000. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a pretty generous incentive com compared to other states. Interconnection policies are the, the policies by which the utility uh, accepts your ability to, to connect to, to the utility grid. And, and these policies can determine how quickly it takes for you to be able to turn your system on. So the Corporation Commission just recently passed some overarching policies on interconnection that the, the industry uh, finds that are good. Uh, but for a long time, it sort of varied utility by utility, how quickly that could happen. Permitting is a really local issue. It's you know, similar to what you deal with if you're doing any kind of construction, major construction job at your home uh, and different cities have different policies and different uh, uh, speeds and rates at which, uh, and costs at which that they deal with permitting. Um, HOAs in Arizona have, uh, uh, are not able to stop you from going solar because of a state law. And so that's been an important policy that we uh, want to maintain. And then there's a couple of policies I threw on here that are um, ones that people have started to discuss and uh, to see if it makes sense <clears throat> to try to work into the system in Arizona. And, and one of those is community solar. So you might think, hey, wouldn't it be great if uh, me and 20 of my neighbors could just share solar from an array at a park down the street. Uh, that's currently not possible under the current uh, structures in Arizona. And so we wanna change that and make it so that there can be community shared solar. And ideally that if you're, as you're signing up for uh, one of these programs that you'll be getting the credits back on your utility bill, the same as if you would um, have put it on your home. And that way renters can access programs like this, folks that might have a roof that's not fit for solar. Um, so there's, there's a lot that can be done there that can help to expand access. <clears throat> and then there's community choice aggregation, which has taken off in uh, some states like California, Ohio is now doing this, um, and, a, and a bunch of others. Um, and, you know, the, this is an idea where uh, cities can come together and decide that they want to choose a different energy provider. Uh, and there are many different ways these programs can be structured. And, and what we would say is, you know, let's find a way for the program to uh, encourage local energy sources, distributed resources like rooftop solar to be a part of the mix. So I really want to spend some time on the Corporation Commission because they're just a really important body in the state government to, to understand. Um, and this was uh, a picture taken from uh, just before the last time I had a haircut <laughs> uh, in early March, uh, which, uh, in which we delivered some petitions to the commission. So the, the Corporation Commission, aka the ACC, is uh, really the fourth branch of state government. It's, uh, there are five commissioners that are elected statewide, just like you would elect a governor or a US Senator uh, to set any policy at the commission. You need a majority of the commission. So you need three commissioners to agree on an issue. And the commission regulates investor owned utilities for the purpose of this conversation. So places like, um, places like APS, TEP, UNS, uh, does not regulate SRP. Um, you can go to the next slide. Uh, and one important policy that the commission has set that has really helped to drive solar development in Arizona has been the Arizona Renewable Energy Standard and Tariff. So I mentioned this earlier. Uh, the commission, not the legislature, really kind of has control um, over uh, this policy and, and can hold the utilities accountable to meeting the amount of renewable energy that they're selling to us. And so the current standard was set in 2006, 2007. Uh, it's 15% by 2025, and that's uh, solar and wind resources. 
And that includes a carve out for distributed solar. So four and a half percent of our total energy uh, has to come from rooftop solar under this plan. Um, but you know, we're sitting here in 2020, the goals have largely been met by the regulated utilities and states around us are uh, taking on way bigger uh, and bolder commitments into the future. And so Arizona has started to um, think about, you know, what, what is our clean energy path forward and what kind of targets can we set? And so uh, as we think about updating the renewable energy standard, uh, Sun uh, has joined a group of 32 uh, stakeholders in the community that uh, is calling uh, under the banner of a joint stakeholder proposal, it's calling for the Arizona Corporation Commission to update the rules uh, under these targets. And so it would call for a 100% clean energy standard by 2045, which would be zero carbon uh, energy, 50% uh, renewable energy by 2030, uh, which is wind and solar energy, so not uh, nuclear, 10% uh, distributed energy by 2030, so that's the rooftop solar uh, piece, and then uh, increase to the energy efficiency standard, which is actually expiring this year. Um, and that's, that's been a really key standard to help save energy in Arizona. And at, at the time, our current standard was a leader. Now we need to continue that. Uh, we're also calling on uh, improvements to the utility resource planning process, which is uh, if you really want to wonk out with me, we can talk about IRPs, integrated resource planning. Um, but essentially, it's, you know, utilities are uh, looking into the future and they're forecasting their load and their energy demand and they're making big decisions about how many power plants do we need, how, many, how much money do we need to charge our customers for those power plants and transmission lines and all the other infrastructure. Uh, and that process today doesn't really work very well. And so we're asking the commission to kind of re reinvigorate that process and make it more transparent and accountable. And then uh, the proposal we've signed on to includes organizations that uh, work on environmental and social issues on the, the tribal nations. And so we've joined with them to call for support for uh, coal plant communities that are where the coal plants are, are shutting down, um, really just based on economics at this point. So uh, coal is not cost competitive with many other resources out there, including solar. And so, but you know, people are losing their jobs and uh, we think that the utilities should play a role in, uh, and the commission should play a role in developing renewable energy on those lands um, and in those places where there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of transmission lines that went to coal power plants that are gonna shut down that we could plug into wind and solar projects. So um, that's, uh, that's what that part of the proposal does. So Sun, just to give you a flavor, and a lot of other organizations have done a lot of other work on this, but we've, um, in this campaign, we've uh, been a part of this stakeholder group. We've delivered about 70 of these uh, postcards that we've asked many of you to, to fill out and send in to commissioners. We delivered a stack of uh, just over 5,000 petitions in March. And uh, many folks uh, were able to call in or to, to go right before uh, before the stay-at-home orders uh, to, to this March workshop to speak out in, in support of renewable energy. We've earned some media coverage. Uh, and, uh, and in March, the commission actually voted to move forward with a 100% zero carbon standard by 2050. Um, and so now the commission staff is coming up with uh, rules according to that. So that's, that's an exciting development, but there's a lot more that needs to be done. We'll talk about that next. So what is next at the ACC? So uh, commission staff are gonna update the proposal based on input from the commissioners. Uh, the staff are kind of like the uh, everyday employees that you know, don't turn over with the political wins. They do a lot of the, the work at the commission to do research and write policy. Um, commissioners, are gonna then debate the rules this, this summer coming up by staff and with input from the public and from groups like ours. And this could happen possibly at the July open meeting, which is the middle of July. 
Uh, and then commissioners would vote to start a formal rulemaking process from there, uh, which would kick off a 30 day public comment period. And so that's the point where we would you know, definitely be asking many of you to speak out uh, and write to the commissioners, which Suki is gonna cover later on, um, some tips on that. And so then the final vote would take place at this point, probably not before uh, August would be pushing it. I think we're looking at September or even further down the road and we'll keep folks updated. Um, and then, uh, so what folks can do right now would be to email the commissioners. Uh, certainly we've listed the emails here and we can send them back out. Uh, definitely hearing from folks one-on-one -on -one with a personal uh, story about why this is important to you would be really helpful right now because uh, once the rules kind of are finalized, uh, there's not gonna be a lot of wiggle room to change them substantially. So we wanna make sure that, that they're as strong as possible going in. Um, and then there's a lot of other ways to help out. So writing a letter to the editor, attending a virtual uh, meeting with a commissioner or with a candidate. Uh, we are uh, embarking on meeting with all five of the ACC candidates that are running this year over the course of June. And so uh, there'll be opportunities to kind of weigh in with folks that are gonna come on as there are three seats up, which we'll talk about next. So this, this is important and I'll just emphasize, you know, SUN is a 501c3 organization. We're nonpartisan. We're not uh, endorsing or opposing any candidates in, in the ACC races, uh, but it, you know, these can be kind of down ballot races that are really important for the energy future of the state. And so we wanna make sure people know that they're happening and, and make sure to vote. So three of the five seats are up for election in 2020. Uh, there are three Democrats that are running and then two Republicans um, that are on the ballot. And again, we're trying to meet with all these folks and so we might be asking you to come to a meeting with us. And then I wanna just um, stop here before I get into SRP uh, and answer a question from Bruce because it's specific to this. So could the ACC adopt a new energy efficiency standard separate from the renewable energy items since the EE standard is ending this year? The answer is yes. And it's possible that um, that could break away or it's possible that the commission um, would uh, basically uh, prioritize the energy efficiency standard and maybe a couple other items that we're asking for. So uh, like the clean energy standard, which they've already agreed to, energy efficiency, and then maybe something else uh, like the IRP issues. So, um, that's definitely a conversation that's going on because it, it is really critical to extend the energy efficiency uh, standard uh, after it expires this year. The renewable energy standard doesn't expire until 2025, uh, so it's, it's a little less urgent, but I um, hope that answers your question. And we'll get to the other questions here at the end of this section. So, um, SRP and rooftop solar. So many folks uh, that are on this uh, webinar, I think have SRP and uh, they have a different process by which they make decisions that impact rooftop solar and rooftop solar customers. So we wanna uh, talk about that a little bit. So SRP is the second largest utility in the state of Arizona. It has uh, just around a or 1 million electric uh, customers. Uh, the setup, uh, as folks may know, is a quasi-municipal nonprofit entity. So it's uh, regulated by a board of directors elected by landowners in SRP territory. And that's a, that's a historical, in my view, antiquated setup. But the, the history is that landowners bonded their, their land to set up the, um, the district, uh, the irrigation district. And so um, votes are based on acreage to elect uh, the district offices to the board. Um, and so there are 10 districts that are drawn within the um, SRP territory. And the more land that you own, the more your vote counts. Um, you must own land to be able to be eligible to vote in SRP. Um, and then there are four seats in, on the board that are at large, and those are one person, one vote. But again, you must uh, own the property and be an eligible voter in the state of Arizona in order to vote in the election. So uh, 
you know, these elections, they just took place in the spring. You might have heard from us encouraging you to vote in them. Um, and, and, you know, they're important because they decide your electricity rates, they decide the solar plans that you're able to be on. Um, and this board uh, back in 2015 was kind of the first entity to uh, just, you know, upend net metering in Arizona and move away from it. <clears throat> so the, the solar rates are, you know, they're kind of tough for, for customers, but they're definitely uh, workable for, you know, certain, for some people. So uh, obviously many of you have SRP and have solar and you're making it work and that's awesome. So uh, some of the reasons why is that SRP has a higher monthly fixed fee, uh, which is $32.44 a month. <clears throat> Uh, for solar customers, for normal customers, without solar, it's around $20 a month. Uh, so there's kind of that extra uh, $12 charge. And to put this in comparison, APS's uh, monthly fee is around $12 a month for regular and solar customers. Um, if you want to have net metering with SRP, the plans come with a demand charge. So uh, if you want to be able to kind of get that one-to-one -one credit back for your energy, uh, you also have to dance around having this demand charge and not using all of your appliances at uh, peak hours. And then uh, plans without a demand charge do not have net metering and you end up getting a really small credit back for the energy that you're sending uh, back to the, to the grid. So, um, you know, this has been a point of contention on the board at SRP for a long time. There's not currently any active issues in front of the board that would address these issues. Uh, but, you know, down the road and as, uh, and that's mostly because there's not a current uh, rate case that's going on, uh, but certainly the next time they open up the rates, there's going to be another discussion about, you know, what it means for rooftop solar. Um, SRP does have a, a few other things going on just policy-wise that I wanted to point out. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've been on um, webinars all day long. <laughs> and I'm losing my voice. Uh, but I was on the SRP 2035 uh, uh, advocacy commission or something, it was called something like that, but we basically were community stakeholders that helped SRP come up with some sustainability goals last year. They're uh, committing to reduce uh, carbon emissions 65% by 2035 and 90% by uh, 2050. Um, they're committing to enable having 500,000 electric vehicles on the road in SRP territory by 2035 through charging and uh, other means. Um, they have adopted some water conservation uh, measures and uh, working on sustainability in their supply chain. Uh, they, they have a really aggressive battery storage incentive uh, right now that some folks, including um, I think Peter on this call this mentioned, he's about to take advantage of. So it's worth up to $3,600. Um, depending on the size of the battery. And then if you took advantage of, uh, or if you installed a demand managing system to uh, get around the demand charges, they offer a $250 <coughs> rebate if you go through a, a preferred installer. So I mentioned this before, but you know, the SRP board approves the rate plans and the budgets. So they're the ones that you uh, need to advocate in front of uh, in order to make changes. Uh, and the SRP sort of rank and file staff are the ones that brings proposals to the board. And oftentimes the board will do, you know, pretty close to what staff recommends. And so it's, it's sometimes um, important to get in touch with the staff and make sure that the proposals coming forward are, um, are as strong as possible. And then uh, SRP does have a lot of public meeting rules and, and public input is required. Uh, but often it's kind of difficult, you know, they'll do meetings at 9 a.m. on a weekday and people are people are working so we're trying to work on uh, ways to uh, improve some of the input that that comes across there so i wanted to mention this i think uh, i think many folks on this webinar have, have attended one of our sun national webinars that dive a lot deeper into this issue that's going on but i did want to include a slide about it and just um, spend a minute on it so uh there's some, some, something big and important going on at FERC right now, which is the Federal Ener Energy Regulatory Commission. 
Uh, these folks are appointed by the president <clears throat> and uh, the commission regulates uh, sort of interstate uh, energy commerce. And there is a, um, a group that um, we think is, is backed by sort of utility interests that has submitted a legal petition that could um, stop net metering and similar crediting methods uh, like export credits for solar owners or, or really drop them down to rates that are uh, really low. And it would kind of give federal control over uh, to, to those, uh, the ways that, that solar is credited, the extra solar that you're sending back. So it's, it's a little unclear what it would exactly mean for Arizona or many other states, but it is um, an important and urgent issue that we're taking very seriously. Uh, we're encouraging folks to uh, weigh in through the website savesolar.org, and there's a lot more information um, there. And we're encouraging, part of our strategy right now is to encourage many uh, organizations and elected officials to intervene on behalf of solar consumers and, um, and constituents in their state. So we're asking attorneys general, um, utility commissioners, uh, you know, other organizations like ours. And there's, there's many, many people that have intervened so far and are, are weighing in. And I think there's a lot of good arguments to be made to say that you know, this is a state's rights issue and to stay out of our business where we've decided what makes sense for, uh, for our state. So we're hoping that FERC will reject the petition, uh, but the comment deadline is in a couple of weeks, so we're not going to know uh, sort of the pathway forward for um, a little bit. If they don't reject the petition, they'll um, consider it and then um, there'll be a decision later on to see how that plays out. Okay, so if anybody has questions about some of this policy stuff, uh, feel free to include in the chat. I wanted to address a couple of questions that have already come in. So Rick asks, any headway on HOAs for townhomes or condos where the homeowner does not own the roof? Um, that's a really good question that I'll have to get back to you on. I've, um, I've started to look into this a little bit. I feel like it depends on the HOA because sometimes you need an easement from the HOA in order to install solar uh, on the part of the roof where you, you know, sort of like above the townhome where you own it. And they would have to grant that easement to you in order to use it. Um, and, and, and those rules might vary by HOA by HOA, but um, I'm not sure, and, and Rick, I'd be happy to follow up with you on your specific situation and see um, what could be done there. And then Bruce asks, if you buy power into community solar and the grid goes down, do you still have power or are you dark? Um, I would assume that you are, uh, that unless you have battery backup, that you would go down with the rest of uh, the grid, same as if you just had solar or if you were just any other customer. But maybe you're asking a different question, I don't know. Okay, any other, oh yeah, great. Oh yeah, so Carl, um, Carl says, I attended the May 6th Sun webinar on the FERC thing. I've got a letter off to the local newspaper, Governor Ducey and the ACC, anything else I can do. Uh, Carl, you're a rock star. I don't know if you saw, but your letter was printed in the, uh, in the Arizona Daily Star in Tucson. And if you haven't seen it, I will, uh, I will send you the link. Uh, it's a great letter. And I think everyone should follow, uh, uh, follow Carl's example. <laughs> and um, I, I think that's what we can do for now. Um, the only the only other thing I would suggest is um, we are starting to ask Chairman Bob Burns at the Corporation Commission if he will weigh in because as the chair of the commission, you know, the thing that this FERC petition would upend would be the commission's authority to set these rates themselves. And, um, Strategically, we think that having especially Republican uh, commissioners and someone like Bob Burns, who is a rooftop solar supporter, 
uh, weigh in would be important. So we're going to be we're asking him to do that. And so if um, if any of you want to email him to ask him to weigh in, that would um, be helpful too. And we'll put his email uh, down. Okay, great. I'm going to turn this section over to Suk and we'll have another chance for questions at the end. So thanks a lot. Okay, so um, I'm going to delve a little deeper into your specific roles um, in regards to citizen lobbying. Um, but before I do that, I just wanted to clarify that um, when, I, when I'm speaking about testifying or um, in-person meetings, um, I am referring to specifically speaking with the Arizona Corporation Commission, um, commissioners and potential candidates um, for the upcoming election. And as Brett mentioned a little earlier, the reason for that is because most of our um, significant energy policy and renewable energy regulation comes from the commission. Um, so it's important that they're the ones that are hearing your voices. Um, but it's also important to know that all of the, the tips and the tactics that we're um, teaching you, they're totally applicable to um, meetings with legislators as well, and also the board members with SRP. So um, you can use them anywhere. Um, so on this side right here, um, what I'm showing you is kind of the levels of citizen lobbying. Um, the reason in-person um, meetings are the tip of the pyramid is because um, we believe that it, it's the most impactful form of lobbying. Um, so that's what we're really going to try to focus on today. Um, um, and I just wanted to reiterate that I know lobbying sometimes has a negative connotation, but in this case, when we're discussing um, grassroots citizen lobbying, the purpose of it is to advocate for good policy, um, policy that protects your rights and promotes the common good. Um, so there's nothing negative about it, and we definitely encourage you to engage in this. So before contacting um, your commissioners, um, it's important to first understand their background, their voting record, their current position on solar. Um, that's really going to help you know where to steer the conversation and whether or not you're going to have to push a little harder um, on certain issues or not. Um, and it, it's also just going to help you um, understand who you're speaking to. Um, and also, while you're preparing what you want to say and which points you really want to hone in on, um, Personal stories are always really helpful. Um, commissioners, candidates, they know the facts, they know the statistics, they have teams drilling that into them. Um, but what they don't know is your personal story and how a decision is going to affect um, your family, your community, your business. So those personal stories are really what's going to tip them to vote one way or the other. So um, really utilize your own narrative. Um, so just a few tips for when you reach out to the commissioners or candidates. Um, you want to make sure that you're being respectful, so always address them by the proper title, whether that's commissioner, um, Mr. Miss. Um, I know there's a current mayor running, so you would address her by mayor. Um, identify yourself um, by your name, your town, your profession, um, and if relevant, your organizational affiliation. Um, so once you um, have all that down, you're going to start reaching out to um, commissioners, candidates to meet with them. Um, like we said, this is one of the most impactful ways to get your message across by sitting down and having an in-person meeting. Um, and I'll just go ahead and say, because of the current situation right now, as I say in-person one-on-one meetings, I am referring to a Zoom meeting, which is our new reality. But um, it's, it's not going to change the logistics too much. You're still sitting and, and having a one-on-one -on -one discussion. So um, it'll still be as impactful as if you're sitting right across from, from the person. Um, so make sure you're requesting these meetings at least one week in advance. Um, that'll just help make sure you're res being respectful of their time, but also your time. Um, and if you're told that the commissioner is not available, um, ask to speak to a staffer. So um, once you have that meeting in place, begin preparing. Um, have an idea of what exactly you want to discuss. Um, writing a page of talking points is always really helpful. Um, it'll make sure you're staying on topic um, and not drifting towards other tangents. Um, 
And if you have written material that you want to share with the commissioner or candidate, um, that's perfectly fine. Just make sure you're keeping it kind of short. Um, and again, you're there to talk to them, not give them something to read. So um, what you're saying is, is going to leave a bigger impact on whatever you, than whatever you give them. So then um, during the meeting, um, you're definitely going to have a lot to talk about. You're all passionate solar advocates, so that's expected. Um, but just make sure you're not dominating the conversation too much. That I mean, it should be a conversation. So you give your point of view and what, um, and what your ask is, but definitely allow the commissioner or candidate to give their point of view, um, list their concerns maybe, um, and, and like I said, it should be more of a conversation, not, not a one-sided lecture. And that'll just um, produce better results too. Um, if you wanna take notes during the meeting, that's totally all right. Just make sure you're keeping a good eye contact. Again, it should be a good conversation. Um, don't just stare down at your paper and take notes. Um, and if you're asked a question during the meeting and you don't know the answer, that's perfectly all right. Be upfront about it and offer to get back to them at a different time. Um, and if you need help finding that answer, you can always reach out to us and we'll help you with that. Um, and then at the end of the meeting, um, thank them for the opportunity, thank them for their time, and then let them know you'll follow up in an email. And then just really quick, if during the conversation, the commissioner or candidate um, kind of disagrees with your viewpoint, um, calmly express your disappointment, um, but be persistent. Um, let them know what else you can do, what else you can give them um, to, to ask them to reconsider, whether that is more statistics or facts, or if it's bringing more people to um, tell their story, tell their narrative, whatever it may be, they could disagree, but um, don't settle with that. Um, ask what, whatever else can be done for them to reconsider. Um, but with that being said, um, if the commissioner or candidate does agree with you, um, express your gratitude for that and then get to strategizing. You're probably not going to use most of your meeting trying to convince them of something if they already agree. Um, so start planning with them about how you can get the other members to agree, the other candidates, um, get the message out, whatever that may be. And then just real quick, whatever material you may need, whatever more information you need, you can always reach out to Sun and we'll definitely help you get that. And then after the meeting, um, review any notes you may have taken, um, send that follow-up email, they'll really appreciate it, um, and include in that email any information they requested. Um, maybe if they did ask you a question that you didn't know an answer to, be sure to include that answer in that email. Um, and reiterate your position in this email. Um, whether they supported you or not, um, reiterate that position and make sure they know um, what you're asking for specifically. Um, and again, if they did support, um, keep encouraging them to urge their other colleagues to also support. Um, so you have other options before, um, besides just a one-on-one -on -one individual meeting. Um, and those other options include just speaking before the commission. Um, and there's a couple options within that. So I think one of the most utilized and most helpful in this situation would be to speak at open meetings um, on particular agenda items. I know uh, in a couple weeks there's going to be some open meetings. Um, I'm not exactly sure what's on the agenda yet, but um, we can get back to you with more information. And if it's applicable, this might be a really great way to start getting your voice out there. But basically... No one I knows it's... No, oh, sorry to interrupt. No one knows it's on the agenda yet. All right, there we'll you go. Yet, so you're, you're good. Okay. So um, if that's something that you'd be interested in, what you would do is register in the, in the um, request to speak system. Um, and you do that either on the day of the meeting or any time after they do publish the agenda. Um, and after you've done that, during the meeting, the chairman will um, give a time for anyone that did request to speak to come up to the podium and speak. But in this case, it'll be on the Zoom call. Um, so I do encourage anyone to do that, and we will keep you updated with whatever the agenda will be for the upcoming open meetings. Um, but what you could also do is make a public comment in a Corporation Commission docket. Um, to do that, you would have to fill out the following form. Um, and when you do this, you have to refer to a specific 
pending case and you really have to be sure you're referring to the appropriate docket numbers. If it's not the right docket number, it's not going to be seen. Um, you can also intervene in a case, and this is for people who are going to be directly affected by a particular decision, but aren't original parties in the case. Um, and I just, I'll go ahead and put the link in the chat, but all of this can be found on the Corporation Commission website, and it'll go into um, deeper detail, but it'll also give you links to all of the appropriate forms you would have to fill out. Um, so another option you have, um, which Brett mentioned a little earlier, and I know one of you have already done this, but you can write a letter to the editor, and this is a great thing to do. Um, maybe if, you've, if you attend a candidate event, or you do attend an open meeting, or maybe you've just been following a docket really closely, we encourage you to write a letter to the editor, um, explain your position, explain why it's important to you, um, call on commissioners by name, um, really get your, um, get your idea out there and gather support for that. Um, and just be sure you're checking with the newspaper um, what their word count guidelines are. Usually it's around 150. All right, so we're kind of at the end, but um, some next steps. Um, join us for meetings with commissioners and candidates. We're planning those throughout the month of June. Um, and next Wednesday, actually, June 3rd, we do have a meeting set up with Bill Mundell, who's one of the candidates for Corporation Commission. Um, and we'll definitely send out some information on that, but we encourage you um, to come to that meeting um, and um, put your advocacy skills to the test there. Um, and take your own action, write a letter or email, um, use the skills that we discussed here. Um, yeah, and you can always find more solar advocacy resources at our website. And if you need any additional help, please always feel free to reach out to either Brett or I. So we'll just take a minute for questions now. Thank you, Sue. So we did get a question from Carl Morgan um, and for, and I'll take this one. So for SRP, do you think there's any chance they will reconsider their current rate schedule for solar? And if yes, when? And also how can SRP customers get involved in that process? And then there's a second question, but I'll answer the first question first. Um, I think there's a chance they will reconsider the current rate schedule, but it will not be for another, uh, at, least, at least another year or two, maybe longer. Um, they call their process um, a, the pricing process. And the last time they went through a pricing process was last year. And they typically only go through the pricing process every two to three years um, and so and the last time around they added three new um, rates rate plans to solar uh, customers but most people are still using the original bad plan <laughs> uh, e27 um, it's it's definitely something that uh, we're interested in there's a few board members on srp that are interested in you know figuring out how to how to change that uh, going forward and you know those processes have opportunities for public input and uh, we will you know, definitely be encouraging folks to weigh in during that time um, the related question is how can a customer get info on the background or rationale for srp's current rate schedule for solar customers because the current schedule appears to be created to strongly discourage customers from adopting solar much more than other utilities in arizona um, I would tend to agree uh, with that. And uh, what I'll do here is actually, um, I went in and dug up, SRP has on their website, the documents from their 2019 uh, public pricing process, which you can find at this link. Um, and I'd have to spend a little bit more time drilling into every PDF <laughs> uh, on this uh, sheet and I can, on this webpage and I can try to follow up um, with some more information, but, the, but every sort of public document that went into the rationale from the SRP management side 
and what happened with the board should be included on that uh, web page so you can you can kind of see what that what that looks like. Um, but they did. <clears throat> I know the management. I could try to dig up, but they they did give presentations as to why they feel that solar customers are. Um, you know, the utilities position is basically that the more that they credit back solar customers, the less um, sort of the less uh, customer base that they have to spread out their costs of the whole system. And so they want, um, their goal is to equalize those costs and to try to um, charge solar customers more because they're getting, you know, because they're paying less because they have solar. Of course, we disagree with that logic because solar customers are in fact uh, bringing some system-wide benefits uh, to the utility because uh, we are lowering costs for the utility during peak hours when it's really expensive to produce power, but the sun is, you know, it's just shining and we're producing and using our own energy. So we're not uh, creating a burden on the grid. Um, and, you know, there's many other reasons. Uh, meeting clean energy goals, uh, we're the ones making the investment, not the utility in the infrastructure and the the documents. So there's a lot of there's a lot of good arguments on, on our side, uh, but uh, you know you can you can dig in and see see some of the reasoning uh, in there. If anybody else has any questions, feel free to shoot them in the chat. They don't have to be super wonky, or they can be kind of wonky, and we can you know go down that rabbit hole if you want to. All right, well, seeing none, I think we'll, uh, we'll wrap this up. Suk, is there anything else we wanted to say before we ended? Um, no, that was, that was about it. I just wanted to, again, thank everyone for joining us this evening. Um, again, I know things are